Hi, it was this is Mr. Lim here again, and this is our seventh video in VA about endpoints and equivalence points and titration curves. Let's get started. All right, so we're going to be learning about this stuff um, here. Okay, so during a titration, an acid is added to a base or vice versa to form a salt and water. We know that. Uh, the point where stoichiometric amounts of acid and base are combined is called the equivalence point. And one thing I want to highlight here is the idea that um, uh, when you add equal, oops, when you add equal acid and base, it's effectively saying that there's no acid and base left. Because you should recognize that they uh, neutralize each other, and if they neutralize each other, therefore there should be no acid and base left. And therefore, the only thing that is left is salt and water. Okay, so that's the idea that uh, at the equivalence point you have uh, salt and water only when you have stoichiometric amounts of acid and base. Why do you want stoichiometric amounts of so uh, acid and base? So that you can um, you can do what's it? You can calculate the number of moles of acid from the base because you have equal or stoichiometric amounts of it. All right, the salts that formed are not always neutral. Okay, and they can be acidic or basic. Right, so that's again that acidic and basic salts from uh, acids and bases. And so therefore, if the salt is produced is acidic or basic, then when uh, equimolar amounts of acid and base are combined, uh, the salt produced will make the equivalence point acidic or basic. So what you need to recognize is that the equivalence point, when you have equal amounts of acids and bases, doesn't necessarily have to be neutral. Okay. Because it's not neutral, it doesn't, it's not at pH 7 at 25 degrees Celsius, um, so therefore we need to have different indicators depending on what titration we do. Okay, so indicators change color at the end point. Okay, so here's a new word, end point, and we had equivalence point, which can be different for different pHs. Oops, which can be different at and different pHs and depending on the nature of the indicator, right? And so you should recognize that the end point can be a range of pHs, not just a single value, okay? So it's a range of pHs like from 6.7 to 7.2 or something like that, okay? So ideally we choose an indicator which has an end point at the same point as the equivalence point, okay? So we want it to be at the same point. So we have to say, okay, the equivalence point, uh, let's have a look at the salt produced. That's going to be acidic, basic, or neutral. Okay, the, that means we need to make the endpoint that. Therefore, we need to pick the indicator which is has an uh, endpoint which is acidic, basic, or neutral, depending on what the thing is. Okay, so, uh, yep. Okay, so so we know when stoichiometric amounts have been combined. Okay, so effectively, remember we need stoichiometric amounts to do the calculations, and so therefore, if we don't get this right, our calculations are going to be are not going to be right. Okay, so in general, acidic equivalence points, uh, we're going to use methyl orange. Okay, for neutral equivalence points, methyl red. Basic equivalence points, phenolphthalein. These are the three that you need to remember so that you can at least say, if they say, oh, here's um, this uh, hydrochloric acid and sodium carbonate, which indicator should you use? All right. Interesting thing about that particular reaction with the HCl and sodium carbonate is that it's going to produce... NaCl, which is a neutral salt, so you're like, oh yeah, it's going to be a neutral pH, but it's also going to produce H2O and CO2, and CO2 is acidic, so therefore you have to take that into account, and it's going to be an acidic endpoint. Okay, so moving on. Um, so during a titration, you are adding an acid to a base, or vice versa. Um, right, so we've discussed that already. The pH will change as you add the acid and base. That makes sense. Since pH is a logarithmic scale, you're adding acid or base at a linear rate, you're not going to get a nice linear change in pH, not unless you're graphing it on logarithmic graph paper, okay? So the idea is that during a titration, your pH will change, okay? That's pretty much it. And so you can use that to work out where the equivalence point is as well, okay? So, whoops, that's not what it's supposed to be. Okay, so at standard conditions, pH will rapidly change uh, with linear increases of acids and bases around pH 7. Okay, so pH rapidly changes when you add acid or bases around pH 7. That's because when these are the, that's when the two concentrations of hydronium and hydroxide ions are the lowest. Okay, so you add a little bit, you're going to cause a reasonably large change in pH. Okay, so effectively the pH will rapidly change when it's in an equivalence point. Okay, which uh, when a reaction creates acidic or basic salts. Okay, so whenever you have that equivalence point, 
it's going to be that flipping of uh, more hydronium to hydroxide or more hydroxide to hydronium, right? And so therefore, you're going to have a large change in pH just around equivalence point. So what does that mean? The rapid change in pH signifies that the reaction has been completed, right? So the volume at this point can be used to determine the volume that was delivered by the burette at the equivalence point, okay? So let's have a look at what this diagram shows here. Okay, this shows the volume of HCl added, right, over time, as and then the pH on this side here, okay? So what you can see is it started off with a high pH, and then suddenly you were adding, 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 and then it suddenly dropped off, right, and then it and suddenly plateaued again. So the equivalence point would effectively be this point here, right, and you would be able to tell on this scale what the volume would be that you of HCl you added for equivalence point because in this titration they've actually gone way past the equivalence point to get this part of the data there. All right. Um, so yeah, you should also notice that it's got a high pH. That's why. Why does it have a high pH? Because uh, it started with a base because you're adding acid to it. That makes sense. All right. So titration curves can also show the points at which polyprotic substances reach their equivalence point for each successive proton's uh, stoichiometry point. Okay, so the idea is that like something like H2SO4, right? The first one is going to be H, it's going to turn into HSO4, and then the HSO4 is going to turn into um, SO4 2 minus, okay? And so therefore, you have an equivalence point for the first one, equivalence point for the first one, and equivalence point for the second one here, okay? And which equivalence point do you want? You want the equivalence point for the second one in theory, Okay, you want, because then you would just use the stoichiometric for the complete reaction. If you use the first one, you can use it, but you have to do it for the, um, for the first ionization of uh, your diprotic or triprotic acid uh, only. All right, so generally you just take the last equivalence point rather than the um, first or second, or first or whatever. All right, so um, that's the idea that you will get the equivalence point at various points on a titration curve for polyprotic acids. You can also use these things to tell you what indicator to use from the location of the rapid pH change, okay? So again, the rapid pH change will tell you, okay, well, see this one here. Oops, not that one. Uh, this equivalence point here changed pH quite low. So if you wanna use that one as a thing, you'd have to um, use a uh, indicator that had a reasonably low endpoint, low pH endpoint. And this one here started about here. So you'd, if you wanted to do this to the second reaction, you'd need a indicator that would uh, change color at a slightly above pH 7 endpoint, right? So that's the idea that the titration curves can tell you what pH uh, the equivalence point is and therefore what indicator you should use if you wanted to use an indicator, right? And titration curves can also show you whether you had an acid or base in the burette or the pipette. So let's take into account this one at the top here, this one here starts with a low pH, which means that this is tracking the uh, the um, the pH of, of the conical flask. And so therefore, a low pH, uh, you would expect that to be um, uh, an acid. What's more is that you might be able to see, if I just get rid of that, that this actually starts at a value less than one. Since it starts at a value less than one, uh, what that means is that it's probably a strong acid as well, right? And reasonably high concentration, or not even high concentration, maybe like a one or a 0.1 molar, right? Uh, then you can also see uh, what you're adding. So you can you know, tell that you're adding a base because A, it tells you to volume of alkali added, but B, you'd be able to tell that it's adding a base because its pH is going up, all right? Um, and you can even see if like once you're at the excess there, you can see the pH there, whether you've added a strong base or a weak base, depending on the final pH as well. Okay, so that's it uh, for uh, endpoint, equivalence point, and titration curves. You do need to know your um, endpoint and equivalence point quite well. It always comes up in exam, so please study that, and please have an understanding of the difference between the two and why you need to match them and how they can be different. All right, adios.